the meeting. Ms. Longmire is one of the nation's foremost subject matter experts on Mexico's drug war and border security issues. She's a service disabled veteran, having served in the U.S. Air Force as an officer and an agent for over eight years. She conducted numerous criminal investigations and worked extensively in the field of counterintelligence. You've got a detailed explanation, so I won't read very much more, but we are glad to have and please welcome Sylvia Longmire. to speak to you. My goal for tonight is to give you a primer or to teach you how to speak to me. More specifically, how to speak to and interact with wheelchair users. But before I can show you how to speak to me, I need to show you how to see me. And I'm hoping that I can use a couple of you as volunteers. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay. Hi, my name is Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia, my name is Samir. Samir, nice to meet you. Is it okay if I tell you a few things about me? Sure. Okay. I'm a mother, single mother. I have two children. My oldest is 11, and my youngest will be nine in July. I was born and raised in South Florida. I started playing the piano when I was seven. I can't play anymore, but I still love it. My favorite musician and singer is Tori Amos. I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. Some might say a dangerous addict. I travel around the world for a living, and I've been to 43 countries as a wheelchair user. My favorite two places in the entire world are Vienna and Singapore. I was divorced four years ago, and I love road trips, absolutely love road trips, and I will be going to Portland and doing some driving up there with my best friend in a few days, and I'm very excited. It's nice to meet you, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sylvia. How do you do, I'm Jack. Jack, is it okay if I tell you a little bit about me? Oh, sure. Okay. I've had multiple sclerosis for 14 years, and I can't walk as a result. My lesions are on my spine, and it affects my legs. Specifically, it affects certain muscles in my legs that allows me to stand up but not be able to lift my legs. I do not have a license to drive this truck. <coughs> no, I do not drink and drive. No, I would not like a horn for my chair because I don't want to draw even more attention that I already drive, uh, that I already drive to myself when I'm out and about. No, uh, you don't have to pray for me if you don't want to, but if it makes you feel more comfortable, then go ahead and, and pray for me. Uh, no, I don't take any additional vitamin supplements to help my MS, but occasionally I'll take some vitamin D and some vitamin uh, D as well. Uh, yes, I can still have sex like a normal person. <laughs> yes, I can feel my legs. And yes, I'm a, and yes I'm, a, I'm a very good driver because I have many years of experience. Thank you very much. Now, by a show of hands between Samir and Jack, do you think Jack got to know me better as a person? Raise your hand. Or do you think, or sorry, Samir, do you think Samir got to know me better as a person? Raise your hand. Or do you think Jack got to know me better as a person? Okay. Now, the kind of questions or the kind of answers that I gave to Samir, the kind of information, those are the kinds of questions that I received before I had MS when I was still walking, whether it was on a date, whether it was out with a group of new people that I had never met before. Basically, those that's the type of conversation that I would have with somebody if I was sitting in a regular chair, just like you, at a table. The, kinds of, the kind of information that I gave to Jack just now, those are answers to the questions that I get now, every day, from total and complete strangers that will come to me from across the room just to ask me those questions. Now, put a pin in that, okay? And we're gonna come back to that part of the conversation. Now I'm gonna move into a travel story. I travel for a living, and as I mentioned to Samir, I've been to 43 countries as a wheelchair user, I've been to 54 countries overall. I work as a travel agent, but my passion is as an accessible travel writer. It is my mission and my goal in life to encourage other wheelchair users to kind of get out of their uh, comfort zone and explore the world. And I try to make that possible by going to places that are somewhat accessible, very accessible, and not accessible at all. 
one of, actually my most recent international trip was to Berlin, Germany. I was there at the end of April, the beginning of May. I had spent at this point for this, the purposes of this story, I had already spent five days in Berlin. It was cold, it was overcast, it was a little bit wet and somewhat miserable, but I had seen a lot of really great things. And after five days, I had pretty much seen almost everything that I felt Berlin kind of had to offer in the accessible, accessible realm. So I was looking for a day trip and I was comfortable with the metro, I was comfortable with the train, I'm somewhat adventurous and I always travel by myself. So I said, let me take a look at what my options are for a day trip and lo and behold, there's Potsdam. Now Potsdam is a small town, it's a suburb of Berlin, which I didn't know, I thought it was much farther away. And there's a lot of historical significance there. The Potsdam Conference of 1945, there are some castles and palaces there, it's a charming, historic little German town, and it was only 17 kilometers outside of Berlin. Very easy for me to hop on the metro, no pun intended, and head over to Potsdam for the day. My plan was to take the metro, get off of the metro, get on a bus, which was accessible, take the bus into central Potsdam, and then get, take the hop on, hop off bus to make the most of a full day and see all of the main sites and, and everything. Now this was a short notice trip. I planned this at 9 p.m. in my hotel room the day before I left, but that was enough to get me very, very excited about seeing a place that I had not even thought about. I'm spontaneous in that way. And I was even more excited because I knew that, physically speaking, it was an accessible plan for the day, as far as the bus, the metro, the ho-ho bus, so on and so forth. So, I'm a bit of an OCD person when it comes to planning, and I usually cross all my T's, dot all my I's, but I said, you know what, everything's been pretty accessible in Berlin so far, the metro's been good, the buses have been good, I'm just gonna go see how it works out. So I got up early, I hopped on the one of the first metro rides out to Potsdam, and it's about a 45 minute ride out to the Potsdam station. So I was, doing some reading on my cell phone, checking the news, checking Facebook, and pretty much entertaining myself like everybody else on the train. Finally, I arrived in Potsdam right on time, 9 a.m., and I was so excited. It was freezing outside. It was a balmy 45 degrees and overcast. Uh, so, and there, were, there weren't that many people on the train. So I got off the train, and as soon as I got off the train onto the platform, I started looking around for the elevator to go down from the metro platform down to the ground. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and then all I see is a drywall plastered in some really pretty little posters surrounding the elevator, informing me that the elevator is being renovated. I said, okay, I got this, all right, this happens all the time. I checked on my cell phone to see if the previous station, because the Potsdam station was the end of the line, if the previous metro station had elevators, because the Berlin metro system has a really nice map that shows you where the elevators are, I said, okay, great. Next station over has elevators, and the bus that I was planning on taking from the Potsdam station to Leibniz or whatever the central part of Potsdam was still runs from that other station. Let's go. 20 minutes later, the train going in the opposite direction left from Potsdam station, and I headed over to the go through the same thing. I get off of the metro, start looking for the elevator, looking for the elevator, looking for the elevator, I find it. The elevator's broken. Not being renovated, it's broken. I said, okay, all right, let's do this again. Check to see if the next station is over. You know how this process is working by now, so I don't need to go into detail about it. Hop back on the train 15 minutes later. Go over to the next station over. I didn't even get off the train because I'm looking at my surroundings, there aren't any buildings around, it's not a residential area, it's nothing but woods and walls covered in graffiti and basically not a safe place for a relatively young lady at 44 in a wheelchair by herself to sit around waiting for a bus. So I got back on the train, the train doors closed and I headed back to Berlin and that was the first time in three years of solo travel to 43 countries that I crossed. I just, you know, I just let it all out and went back to Berlin. Now, the rest of the day, it wasn't a wash. I was still able to do some, some cool things and explore Berlin and do some things that I wasn't planning on doing before. So it all worked out, but that's not the message that I'm trying to get across to you. 
I want to pose a question to you, and I want to kind of challenge perhaps the uh, traditional thinking or the traditional philosophy that you might have had towards people with disabilities or people in wheelchairs, and the word disability. Thinking of me and picturing me on that platform in Potsdam with that broken elevator. Am I disabled or was I disabled by the fact that I cannot walk down the stairs? Or was I disabled by the fact that the elevator wasn't working? All right, let me rephrase that. Am I disabled by the fact that my body doesn't work the same way your body works? Or am I disabled by the fact that my environment is not modified or built to allow me to get to the same places that you can or participate in the same activities that you can? So let's pivot back now, again, taking that story in the context, and let's go to where we first started in the conversation about how you see me and how you get to know me or people like me. There are two philosophical models or theories, I guess you could say, when it comes to disability. The first one is called the medical model, and that is the way that the vast majority of society views wheelchair users or people with any sort of disability, deformity, physical need in order to get from point A to point B. And that is that I am sick, I am somehow uh, broken, and I need to be fixed. That I am disabled because my legs don't work, or somebody else is disabled because they have muscular dystrophy, or cerebral palsy, or they have a spinal cord injury, whatever the case may be. And we see technology that's coming out nowadays, and I get Facebook messages 20 and 30 times from people showing me the latest technology that's designed to help me stand, that's designed to help me walk. Basically, society views me as someone who is inherently unhappy or inherently sad because I'm not walking. That's the medical model. And everything is aimed or everything has the goal of either curing me or helping me walk again. So that's the, that's the medical model. Then there is the social model. The social model isn't completely new, but that seems to be the model that most people with disabilities and most wheelchair users are adopting. And that we're not disabled by our bodies, we are disabled by the world around us. Now, if there's an elevator, I'm able to do what you're able to do. If there's a ramp, I'm able to do what you're able to do. If there is a curb cut in the sidewalk, if there is any kind of modification, I have a van that's sitting right outside and it has a ramp to get me in, it has a transfer seat, and I transfer from this chair into the driver's seat, and I can drive anywhere and everywhere that I want to go. If the restaurant that I want to eat has an accessible restroom, guess what? I can go eat and I can pee there too. So basically, when the environment is modified, I am your equal and you are my equal, and I can participate in society. So am I disabled? if I'm able to go to the very top of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, because they have an elevator? Am I disabled if I'm able to take a helicopter ride and land on the Taku Glacier in the middle of Alaska because the helicopter had a chairlift that took me up level to the seats in the back of the helicopter? Am I disabled if I'm able to eat Polish sausage in Poland, if I'm able to eat Danish in Denmark, if I'm able to eat Frankfurters in Frankfurt? It's a philosophical question, but nonetheless. Now, a lot of people see wheelchair users as trapped. Many times in the media, especially media reports, and even in conversation, you hear the terms wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair. Hate is a very strong word, it really, really is. And I teach my children, my children do not use the word hate when it comes to uh, their food, if it's vegetables, whatever the case might be, because it's a strong word. You know, we have hate crimes. The Nazis hated Jews. You know, hate is a really strong word, and I prefer not to use it if at all possible, and I teach my children not to use it. I hate the terms wheelchair bound and confined to a wheelchair because it implies, it implies that I am in prison. It implies that I am in jail for a crime that I committed solely by the fact that I cannot walk. Based on everything I've told you, all right, do I seem to be bound or confined to anything in any way? Again, I want to reframe the way that you look at me. This is my freedom. 
I am not confined, I am not in jail. This is my freedom because this chair allows me to get from point A to point B. Many people who are not in wheelchairs don't look at us that way. They see this as an impediment. They see this as something that's holding us back where it's just the opposite. Our wheelchairs and our, cu our crutches and our walkers set us free and allow us to go where we wanna go and when we wanna go. So look at it that way. So putting all of that together, how do you interact and how do you talk to wheelchair users? It's awkward for a lot of people, it really, really is. Again, I travel by myself and going on cruises, which I go on at least eight or 10 cruises every year. That's where I get it the most. And I choose my, itiner I choose my cruises based on the itinerary and fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you wanna look at it, the itineraries that I choose are most popular with seniors, generally in their 70s and in their 80s. And I attribute this to a generational thing. I get it, my parents are 82 and 81. And people try to be friendly and they try to be nice. However, the answers that I gave you or the information that I gave you when we were talking earlier, 95% of the questions that elicit those answers come from seniors who will come across a room just to ask me those things. Uh, elevators are my worst nightmare because for whatever reason, it's an American thing. It is totally an American thing because when I'm in Germany or I'm in China, surrounded by a lot of people in an elevator, it's complete silence. Nobody bothers me, nobody talks, nobody asks me questions. But you put me in an elevator with a bunch of 85 year olds on a cruise ship and all of a sudden, what happened to you? What's wrong with your back? Oh, I hope you don't exceed the speed limit. Do you have a license for that? Don't drink and drive. This is typical and it's a struggle for me to be polite and sometimes I just blow because if it's happened to me five or six times in a day, I lose my cool and it's never, it's never good to be rude, it's really not. But these are the kinds of things that we deal with and it's all because nobody seems to know how to approach us. And the best things I can tell you based again on my experience and what I've explained to you today about what this represents to me and to other wheelchair users and what disability or I, how I feel that disability should be viewed as not something wrong with my body or something broken with my body, but something we wanna see fixed with the world. When you approach someone like me or someone else in a wheelchair, pretend this is a purse. That sounds kind of crazy, but pretend this is a purse Pretend it's a wallet, pretend it's an accessory. It's a really big purse and it costs a lot of money, so pretend it's a Gucci or a Louis Vuitton. That's the best way, <laughs> that's the best way that I can associate it. And the chairs are big and I'm not stupid, okay? Human nature is what it is. Certain things are obvious because they're right in your face. But look at it as an accessory. This is a part of, this is an extension and a part of my body. I don't like crowds because people will lean on my wheelchair, they'll touch my wheelchair, they'll just hang on to it when they're in an elevator or they'll try to push it or something. If somebody did that to your arm or to your leg, you would, your bubble would feel kind of invaded. When I'm on the road or sidewalk, I feel every single little nudge, every crevice, every bump, everything. Uh, if anytime somebody runs into it, I feel it. I know exactly where it's coming from. This is an extension of my body. So again, paying respect to the wheelchair user and is this either as a part of my body, just an extension or an accessory, it helps the chair disappear. If you would not ask a question of a regular person that's walking, probably not a good idea to ask it of a wheelchair user. And again, just pretend the chair isn't there. Pretend they're sitting at a table. Pretend they're sitting on a couch. Just say hello. Again, just pretend we're like everybody else. And you don't even have to pretend because guess what? We are like everybody. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Just go ahead. Bring the sun.
use with muscular dystrophy. At one point, they all three used an electric wheelchair and the freedom that gave them was phenomenal. It was um, a necessary accessory to them. So I can appreciate that. All right, the next part of our series. Uh, we had a guest arrive in, after our introduction.